Chapter 20 Primrose came to a halt. Turning the dim light on herself, she put a finger to her lips. She drew gloves from her pocket and pulled them on. So did David. She pointed to the ground and got down on her hands and knees. David, with a faint shudder, did likewise. They began crawling. Wet blood, wet blood red stalks came at David like a nightmare, bumping his nose and slipping across his cheeks. Damp leaves licked his ears. The sog soaked straight through to his knuckles and his knees. He hated worm hunting. As instructed by Refrigerator John, they crawled in the same direction, side by side. Whatever worms showed up in their paths were theirs. The chirping of a hundred unseen crickets masked their own rustle. They had barely begun when Primrose pounced. She held up her hand. David's red beam revealed two inches of wiggling dangling from her gloved fingertips, an ordinary worm. She dumped it into her jug and in front of a proud grin held up five fingers, a nickel for her. Then David saw one, another two incher. He picked it up, dangled it in her face and stuck out his tongue into the jug, a nickel for him. For the next several minutes, they both collected a good handful of worms, all of them two and three inchers. David kept tabs on his growing wealth, 25 cents, 25, 30 cents. He could now understand the profit for night crawlers. 25 cents for one swoop, four and you had a dollar. But where were they? Refrigerator had said they would be all over the place. He was about to pick up another two-incher when his eye caught movement in the hazy edge of light. He looked and yelped, snake, as he leaped into Primrose's back. Primrose jumped to her feet to shed him, but he clung like a saddle, his arms around her neck, legs around her waist. She peeled him off, growling, that was no snake, that was a night crawler. I saw it go back in its hole. She smacked his shoulder. And that's probably where they all went now, you big baby big mouth. Her fist shook in front of his nose. She abruptly stomped off in the other direction. David hurried after her. Hey, don't you lose me. She whirled. She squeezed his shoulders. She shone her light in his eyes. Are you going to keep your mouth shut? Yes. Are you going to make me mad again? No. She shone the light on the watch. Half an hour left. She dropped to her hands and knees and started crawling. David fell, fell in beside her. Within seconds, Primrose had stopped and signaled David to a halt. Five feet ahead of her, lying flat across the ground, as easy as you please, was the longest worm David had ever seen. And that wasn't even all of it. One end was still in the hole. He stayed rock still and held his breath while Primrose did as instructed, creeping ever closer, closer, holding the light steady, steady, until now. She clamped its tail at the hole and held on. The monster worm flailed about for a good minute before Primrose was able to pull it free. With both hands, she held it out full length. It looked like as long as a school ruler and as fat as a man's thumb. She poured it into her jug and flashed five fingers five times, 25 cents. David started crawling and was promptly rewarded with a long, fat one in his own path. In his haste, he moved too fast, jerked the flashlight, and thump, the worm was gone. Primrose made a mocking snort. David stuck out his tongue and pushed on. He'd show her. The next night crawler he came to, he did it right. Slow, silent, clamped the tail. Yes, he had it. It looked longer than hers, maybe a world record. He reached over and wagged it in her face, dumped it into his jug and paused to calculate. Counting the two inches, he was up to 55 cents now. He plowed on, ignoring weeds and wet, spurning the two-inch runts, flicking them aside. He was going for big game now. There was one. Got it. There. Got it. Compared to Easter eggs, worms were a snap. They were still following parallel paths, but they were no longer side by side. When one stopped to nab a worm, the other moved ahead. It was a race. Quarter by quarter, David's total rose. Unlike Primrose, he had nothing particular in mind to spend his money on. He just loved the idea of accumulating money. If there were so many night crawlers in this small area, think of how many there were all up and down Tulip Street. He could make a million. He was up to $3.60 when he spotted the next victim, 
a fat 10 incher up ahead and a little to the left. Closing in slowly on his prey, he pounced on one end just as another gloved hand, primroses, snatched the other end. They lifted together. The worm was like a short, slick jump rope between them. Let go, hissed Primrose. You let go. I saw it first, growled Primrose. I did, growled David. Primrose pulled. David pulled. The 10-inch worm became 11 inches. I need the money, snarled Primrose. So do I, snarled David. I'll spit on you if you don't let go. Um, screeched Primrose. I'll spit on you, screeched David. They stood. Primrose pulled. David pulled. Twelve inches. It's mine, roared Primrose. It's mine, roared David. She pulled. He pulled. Thip. Each now held six inches of flailing nightcrawler. See what you did, yelled Primrose. She, um, David threw his half at her. You did it. You're greedy. It was my worm. You took it. Um, with the hand speed of a yo-yo ace, David flipped the lid off of Primrose's jug, turned it over, and shook it. By the time Primrose reclaimed the jug, a half dozen ten inches were in the ground, crawling back into the night. In the beam of David's flashlight, her eyes burned like a demon's. She stepped toward him. He backed up. She was about to take another step, but halted. She smiled evilly. She held her flashlight before him. Take a good look, she said. As David stared, he was impressed by the perfect round redness of the flashlight. He wondered why worms couldn't see it. Primrose's voice, seeming to come from the red disc, said liltingly, have a good night, and the light went out. David raised his own light, pointed it. She was moving off, reduced already to a shoulder and a jug rope at the dissolve, dissolving limit of the red beam. He tore off the rubber cap and jabbed the fresh light outward. She was gone. He was all alone. He heard a rustle. There, there. His light showed only weeds and night.